Hello, everybody, and welcome to Transformation Generation Podcast. Or if you're watching us right now, it's History Makers TV. Just take a moment and like and subscribe. Also, subscribe to our podcast. There's just, we're pumping out incredible stuff. So glad that you've joined us today as we continue our series, a mature apostolic uh, prophetic series. <laughs> That's what we're talking about. We're looking for the mature apostolic prophetic synergy and what God is doing today in building up his body. Now, today I want to hone in a bit on Canada. Oh, Canada. If you don't know, I'm a Canadian and there's lots going on. Uh, in the t Canadian terrain. And of course, how can you do a mature apostolic and prophetic series without touching on what's going on in Canada? Now, my topic for today, though, is Canadian revival, the winged unicorn. <laughs> I try to say this and I'm, and I'm, I'm not making fun or sacrilegious, but Canadian revival, the winged unicorn, the prophets can't seem to capture. What a fascinating title, and I'm dead serious about that title. And uh, let me just do a little introduction here. If you didn't know, Canada, the nation, which I love, which is rich in prophetic roots, revival roots, intercessory roots, and movements have come out of Canada, and we've been able to bless the nations of the world with that, and with our own spiritual strengths also come spiritual diseases. As you know, every nation has them, and uh, as we come to what I've been heralding as the end of prophetic overemphasis, overemphasis, never the end of the prophetic, we've begun to see many things across our landscape that we probably don't want reproduced in the nations of the world. If you know anything about Canada, we are people who prophesy, we are people who pray, and we're always waiting on revival. We're always uh, looking back and remembering previous revivals and honoring history and trying to redig ancient wells and all of that. But the fact of the matter is there's an aspect of Canadian charismaticism that really borders on some funky stuff, especially, especially right now. And if you were to look at how Canada does the gospel, and, and obviously I'm painting a broad brush here, not everybody does everything, but uh, you'll actually see a little bit of a different gospel than you find in the New Testament. We're always kind of waiting for this mysterious revival. That's why I called it the, the winged unicorn as we're trying to capture this thing. And if you know anything about the unicorn in fables, it's this uh, horse with a horn and wings that people say exists. They say you'll see it, but you never quite see it. It's legendary and it's talked about, but it's never actually materialized or, or realized. Now, Canada has had some great revivals in its, in its history, but we've kind of become a bit stagnant as a nation, almost falling into what I would characterize as the idol of revival, the idol of revival, where we actually have almost frozen in time through an overemphasis of prophecy. We've almost frozen the gospel, waiting always for something that's coming. And I, I, I said this here that if, if there's anything that the Canadian prophets struggle to predict, it's both political outcomes, as we know, we, we never seem to get those right, and as well, a coming revival. It's no secret if you go to any meeting across the country, uh, most charismatic meetings, somebody seeing something, hearing something, we quote different prophecies that suddenly revival's going to come. Now, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with longing for revival? Most people, well-intended, who just love the Lord. We long for his presence. We want revival. We want a visitation. There is absolutely nothing wrong with that. I remember the days of going down to the revival in Pensacola, the suddenly of God that hit on Father's Day and, and changed everything. Uh, of course, I live not too far from Toronto Airport Church now, Catch the Fire, and, and pastors and leaders flew in from all over the world experiencing a revival or renewal. They were refreshed. Who doesn't want that? I want that, and I want it every day. However, if we limit the gospel 
to a moment in time that might one day come, we'll actually be irresponsible with a very now gospel that Jesus gave us. You may have heard the phrase revival is now, and that is actually true, and it's more biblical than all of us trying to twist God's arm through mysticism and prophetic acts, thinking that if we contend, you'll hear that word a lot, if we can just contend enough, then God will have mercy on us and he will come down and change everything, or that he will come down and reach a harvest that actually he's told us to go and reach. And so I kind of call this thing the the always coming but not yet gospel. <laughs> the always coming but not yet and over the last 30 years of being in ministry circles, and I've been part of various movements in Canada, good ones with good people, uh, different intercessory movements, Canadian Prophetic Roundtable, Watchmen, all of that, uh, we kind of got used to each year, something's coming, but it not yet. And then uh, next year there's more, or at the next event there's more. And you kind of get this picture, again, none of this is with an edge or bitterness, but just as much as you treasure what you discern spiritually, we also need to treasure the brain God gave us and our ability to critically think and, and reason with God, function in understanding and function in, in wisdom. But when we, when we look at this forever waiting for something, it's kind of like dangling a carrot in the eyes of, of God's people here in Canada. Something's coming, but not yet. And because the something hasn't come yet, and we've gone year after year, decade after decade, with the nation actually getting worse, if you, if you measure the results and if you measure the trajectory of the nation, we haven't seen really the things we've prophesied about and talked about. It's not that they'll never come, but not yet, I guess. And so when you measure that and look at it, uh, you begin to see a picture of a people frozen in time, always saying something's coming. And when it doesn't arrive, we hold another meeting or another gathering, and we're, go we're gonna continue to contend, and through prophetic acts, we're gonna somehow get God to move. Now, in Canada as of late, we know that many of our prayer warriors, intercessors, and different ones, because of the troubled state of our country, which is a reality, and we need to never stop praying. But because of the troubled state that, uh, of our nation, we have slid into what we know to be called nationalism, where prayers and almost everything we do in Christianity is, is aimed at social justice issues and especially politics. That's why you're gonna see prophecy. If you, if you cross the border into Canada, you're gonna see prophecy and politics very intertwined and a very nationalistic thing. And you'll hear things said like Canada will be saved or now we've saved Canada and we're saving Canada. Well, what do you mean by that saving Canada? Are we saving the economic system? Are we saving the poor? And my point is there's nothing wrong with saying Canada shall be saved. God wants to disciple whole nations. But if we go too far on that pendulum, we begin to distance ourselves from the individuals around us in our sphere of influence. We begin to have this kind of mystical fantasy of the nation is saved now. We held an event on a stage with lights and smoke and bands and, and we shouted, we danced, we did every prophetic act we knew to do, the prophets prophesied and, and we did protocols and we rehashed repentance and forgiveness and, and what you actually end up with is people walking away from that event saying there, the nation has been saved. And then the insanity begins of when we don't see the results we prophesied, we do it all over again. And we keep doing it. And we've been doing it for the last 30 years. What really is going on here if we were to take a step back and look at Canada's intercessory approach to discipling nations? We actually have slid into a very distanced approach in comparison to what is biblical, the biblical model. After all, Jesus didn't say one day revival is coming or one day the harvest is coming. In John 4, Jesus said, uh, do not say, <laughs> 
there are still four more months and then the harvest. For I tell you, the harvest is ripe right now. And he actually addressed that the issue was with the laborers. He did say, pray the Lord of the harvest, but he didn't pray the Lord of the harvest to come down and do what the laborers are supposed to do. He prayed the Lord of the harvest that laborers would be sent out. One thing I've discovered in all of the intercessory events I've been part of, and I've been in many, all the prophetic roundtables, prophetic words, prophets saying, on Rosh Hashanah, now we're going to enter a revival, and now the harvest has come, and now Canada will be saved. If there's one thing that is sure, those prophecies have rarely, if almost never, come to pass in Canada. What always is in season, though, and what always I found is effective, is reaching the lost and the harvest that's within your orbit and sphere right where you are. How I began to stumble upon this was for myself, after doing 20 to 30 years of these kind of gatherings, which I still love, I still believe in prayer, I still believe in unity, relationships, prayer works, it's part of the sequence for national transformation, yes, but if you don't ever go out, if you've, what good is it if you bind the strong man spiritually, but then you don't send laborers out to actually occupy territory? One thing I began to see when I got into training and equipping, and that's a story all on its own, and we have fantastic testimonies of people reaching people all over the world, real steps towards national transformation in some of the countries that we're in. One of the things I noticed is that if the laborers are equipped properly, that when they are sent out into the harvest, they actually can reach people. <laughs> I know. And it didn't need a, a corporate gathering. There were no prophetic acts needed, but all of us have spheres and metrons that if we're equipped properly in our calling, purpose, and destiny, there really is no hindrance. There's no waiting for a coming harvest. The harvest is here right now. I want you to picture, for example, a farmer who goes and sows seed in his field. And, and the farmer wants a return on his investment of seed in the form of the harvest. And we see this biblically in Matthew 13 that God does the same thing. He sows sons and daughters seeds of the kingdom into the harvest, it says. Now, imagine this farmer goes and sows seeds and then one day he wakes up in the morning and he looks out the window and he sees the harvest is ripe. There's fruit in the field. There's excuse me, vegetables in the field. And then uh, he nudges his wife and says, honey, look, the harvest is plentiful. <laughs> and there's, there's vegetables out there. Now imagine they joined hands, got down on their knees and begin to intercede that the vegetables would, would mystically get up and make their way into the barn. No, the farmer doesn't do that. The farmer springs into action because seed time is over. Now it's harvest time. The farmer goes and sends his sons. <laughs> he hires laborers to go into the field and get a harvest that is already ripe. And this is really the missing ingredient that I see often in especially first world uh, nations where we've become so bored with evangelism, so our Christianity has become such comfort-based culture Christianity that we kind of get tired of that and, and the effort it takes to reach somebody, the effort it takes to disciple somebody, and we resort to really mystical wow meetings uh, of all kinds of prophecies, and we kind of look forward to and get frozen in time that one day something is coming. Now, am I tossing out anybody who gets a prophetic word about a, a wave is coming? You know, that's a common one. Um, <clears throat> the eagles are landing uh, in Canada and nesting, and am I throwing that out? Absolutely not. I believe in kingdom mystics. I believe in all of that. But I want to co contribute here by saying that mysticism and prophetic acts, prophecies, and even prayer are not enough on their own to transform a nation. 
And we see this in whether it's the continent of Africa, where, by the way, so many of them pray longer than you, have greater prayer meetings attended by more people, yet many of the African nations are suffering systemic poverty, all of that hardly transformed and discipled. So what are we lacking here? There actually is the component of effective training and equipping, sending laborers and returning to genuine discipleship. We get so excited over these prophetic words. We gather people, we do this, we do that, we sweat it out. And there's always this sense of, of contending and effort, sort of like the prophets of Baal that jumped around and cut themselves, and I, I want to be careful here, I'm not calling many of our prophetic leaders or intercessors who I love and I'm friends with, I'm not calling them prophets of Baal, but this idea that if we can practice a certain form of mysticism or prophetic actions, we unlock a formula that brings revival down and now the nation is saved. And I'll hear some of them talk that way. Right here in Canada, when something goes on, a, a world event that's positive, well, we prayed that in, or we contended for that, or we did that. And you see the at the root system, the ambition, ownership, and entitlement. And even the territorial spirit at times where people say, look, we're an elitist group, that have been laboring and for the body in Canada and, and it's kind of like it belongs to us and none of this is biblical at all. And we see even the workers in the vineyards, the, one that, the ones that came late got the same reward and we just see a very different gospel coming from, from Jesus. What does Canada need at this point when we're, we're chasing this winged unicorn that year after year never seems to land? What does Canada need at this stage? I believe we're on the verge of a great reset as a nation. I believe even as of the last number of weeks, God has provoked some things. And, and remember, without uh, pressure applied, or the saying is, all things are static until pressure is applied, meaning nothing moves until there's an amount of pressure applied. When a nation gets very stagnant, and needs to be moved. God will apply pressure, oftentimes with packaging that offends us. It's so that it can provoke some, not just discussion, but perhaps a change of heart when we got stuck. Canada has been stuck. And uh, it's, it's wonderful to see that God has not abandoned Canada. We've got great evangelistic movements happening, crusades, services, different things, gatherings of prayer, which again, I love. All of that is good. But Canada got stuck in a prophetic loop uh, chasing a winged unicorn, thinking that one day God will come down if we can work the right code, <laughs> if we can perform the right formula, or there needs to be more protocoling and, and repentance forgiveness here, then that will activate God to come down and save Canada. Actually, what we're trying to do is jump around and get God to come down and do what he's trying to get us to do. The harvest is already ripe. We already have discipleship tools. We already have evangelistic tools. We already know how to organize righteousness and bring the kingdom to our spheres. And my heart is to see a, a Canadian church awakened and shaken out of the holding pattern, the prophetic holding pattern we're in, that something's coming but not yet. And as soon as we can let that go, we can step out into actions led by faith, driven by faith, and activate a very now revival gospel. I pray for the, prophetic, the, the, the prophets in the land and prophetic voices as we are about to embark on a brand new scene. There is an emerging, arising prophetic company. There's something new happening for Canada and it's good. But as soon as we activate and get going, I believe God will respond. It's Canada's time. It's time for change. The harvest is ripe. What are you waiting for? God bless. Coming up next week, I would often get my butt kicked in Canada and, and <laughs> go through betrayal, go through all different things. But when I would enter another nation, because of what I went through and the humility that it brought, I was able to carry a fresh authority 
that gave me immunity in some nations that have some heavy-duty principalities. 